Hi everyone. So I'm continuing on with Frederick Schlegel and the Romantics in this part. So the life of Dorothea Schlegel was dramatic, sometimes painful and full of ironies. This intellect and spirited woman entered the world as the eldest daughter of the pride of European Haskala Moses Mendelssohn. Like three others of the six Mendelssohn children in the time she left Judaism behind, but her departure from Judaism and from her family was the most profound. She divorced the Jewish husband her parents had chosen for her. Later, she converted to become a Lutheran and married Frederick Schlegel, a literary scholar. Four years after their marriage, both Dorothy and Frederick became Catholics. Now let's have a look at Frederick Schlegel. So Frederick Schlegel, Carl Wilhelm Frederick Schlegel, Apparently, was a German poet, literary critic, philosopher, philologist, and indologist. With his older brother August Wilhelm Schlegel, he was one of the main figures of Jena Romanticism. Born into a fervent Protestant family, Schlegel rejected religion as a young man in favor of atheism and individualism. He entered university to study law, but instead focused on classical literature. He began a career as a writer and lecturer, and founded journals such as Athenaeum. In 1808, Schlegel returned to Christianity as a married man with both him and his wife being baptized into the Catholic Church. That's a big move. This conversion ultimately led to estrangement from his family and all friends. He moved to Austria in 1809 where he became a diplomat and journalist in the service of Clemens von Mitternich. A foreign minister for the Austrian Empire, Schlegel died in 1829 age of 56. He was a promoter of romantic movement and inspired Samuel Taylor, Coleridge, Adam Mikowicz and Kazimierz Brodinski. The first to notice what became known as Grimm's Law, Schlegel was a pioneer of Indo-European studies. So this is the uh, field of linguistics and interdisciplinary field of study dealing with Indo-European languages both current and extinct. The goal of those engaged in these studies to amass information about the hypothetical proto-language from which all of these languages are descended. So hypothetical, this is not proven, but we get the term Indo-European languages for a German people, for English people, for all of Europe basically. Now why do I have a problem with this? Well, I have a problem with this because what's happening today is that everybody's saying, I hate the Abrahamic religion or I hate the Abrahamic faith and I identify with being a pagan. So like some Viking or Valkyrie or all of these sort of this mythology that was promoted through this romantic period. A lot of people today are doing this because they're saying, well, they're looking at this rabbinical group today that's controlling everything and saying I don't want anything to do with that that's not my heritage and they'd be right because it's not their heritage but what they're actually doing is falling into the trap of these people because in the last video as I explained all of this mythology and Arianism comes from the oriental religions and those oriental religions are pure Kabbalistic and Babylonian religions so what they're ultimately doing is forcing you into their religion because they're Kabbalists and Talmudists. So don't you see what's happening is you're becoming a pagan and following this Aryan Oriental mythology that's been given to us by the Jesuits and by these very people. I believe in a different heritage for the European people and I think that they're lost tribes of Israel. I think that our heritage is Abrahamic, the true Abrahamic Israelite faith. And if Europe does have a pagan history, it's because these northern tribes of Israel fell into paganism of the surrounding nations around them and they incorporated it into their nationality. They mixed their religion with the truth. Comparative linguistics and morphological Typology publishing in 1819 the first theory linking the Indo Iranian and German languages under the Aryan groups. So, this is what I've been saying. I don't think that Germans are Aryan. I think maybe their languages could be, 
but you know as i showed earlier with the bible that the greeks hellens who were living amongst the greeks were speaking their language they weren't speaking a semitic language and uh yeah so this is the start of this aryan romanticism and what the nazi party took on as this german aryanism so it's interesting because you know schlegel comes up with this woman who's moses mendelssohn's daughter the german jewish philosopher who went to the tubingen school he's part of these uh rabbi families that are linked with the rothschilds but you know this schlegel is also linked to frederick schlemacher and it says that he lived with the two schlegel brothers in it says here Schleimacher became acquainted with art, literature, science, general culture. He was strongly influenced by German Romanticism and represented by his friend Karl Wilhelm Frederick von Schlegel. That interest is born by his confidential letters on Schlegel's Lucinde, as well as by seven-year relationship with Eleanor Christine Grunau, nee Kruger, the wife of Berlin clergyman. August Christian Wilhelm Grunel. So, you know, this guy, he's a teacher of Ferdinand Christian Bauer. So his uh, main schools of thought were based on Frederick Schleimacher and Hegel. So, you know, these people all tie into each other. You know, this person, Karl Wilhelm Frederick Schlegel, is converting to Catholicism. Was he a Jesuit? Possibly he got some high-ranking job out of his conversion with his wife, Mendelssohn. Here we've got all these people connecting up to these certain groups and movements and philosophies of Orientalism, which led to Arianism. So we've got Schleimacher, who's a philosopher who's living with the two Schlegel brothers, whose name's almost an anagram of Hegel. And Schleimacher and Hegel are both the philosophers that influence Ferdinand Christian Bauer. Then we have Schlegel being the person who basically invented the theory of the Indo-European language group. And he's married to a Mendelssohn, who's a family branch of the Rothschilds and part of these rabbi classes. We have Spenner, who is the godfather of this guy, who's attached to all of these occult groups and the cult of Sabbatai Zevi. And Spenner is a relative of Schlegel. Spenner is the father of the piety movement. I mean, what's going on here? Can we see all of these connections lead back to these rabbinical families? Three things must certainly be taken into account in any attempt to understand Bauer's life and thought and their significance. First, Bauer was an heir to one of the most extraordinary ages in history of German culture. Beethoven died in 1827, Hegel in 1831, Goethe in 1832, Schleimacher in 1834. It is the age of Goethe, the age of German idealism, and its most elemental and Often divisive forces were the classism of Goethe and Schiller, the Romantic movement, the idealistic philosophy, and the so-called historical school, represented most brilliantly by Savigny, the jurist and Rank, the historian. Many indeed were the ideas which this age developed to perfection and turned into potent cultural forces. So I spoke a bit about classicism and the Romantic period in the last video. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe was a German poet, playwright, novelist, scientist, statesman, theatre director and critic. His works included plays, poetry, literature and aesthetic criticism as well as treatises on botany, anatomy and colour. He is widely regarded as the greatest and most influential writer in German language. His works have a profound and wide range of influence on Western literary, political and philosophical thought from the late 18th century to the present day. Goethe took up residence in Weimar in November 1775 following the success of his first novel, The Sorrows of Young Werther. He was ennobled by the Duke Saxe Weimar Karl August in 1782. 
Goethe was an early participant in the strum and drain literary movement. During his first 10 years in Weimar, Goethe became a member of the Duke's Privy Council, sat on the War and Highway Commissions, oversaw the reopening of silver mines in nearby Ilmenu, and implemented a series of administrative reforms at the University of Jena. He also contributed to planning of Weimar's Botanical Park and the rebuilding of its Ducal Palace. So Goethe was the writer of the play Faust. It's a tragic play in two parts by John Wolfgang von Goethe, usually known in English as Faust, Part 1 and Faust Part 2. Nearly all of Part 1 and the majority of Part 2 are written in rhymed verses, although rarely staged in its entirety. It is the play with the largest audience number on German language stages. Faust is considered by many to be Goethe's magnum opus and the greatest work of German literature. So remember in the last video when I was talking about Simon Magus, it said that it's believed that Goethe's Faust was based on Simon Magus. So it's kind of strange that this has popped up in this particular talk. So Faust 1 takes place in a multiple setting, the first of which is heaven. Mephistopheles, Satan, makes a bet with God. He says that he can lure God's favourite human, Faust, who is striving to learn everything that can be known, away from righteous pursuit. The next scene takes place in Faust's study where the ageing scholar, struggling with what he considers the vanity and uselessness of scientific humanistic and religious learning turns to magic for the showering of infinite knowledge. He suspects, however, that his attempts are failing. Frustrated, he ponders suicide but rejects it as he hears the echo of nearby Easter celebrations begin. He goes for a walk with his assistant Wagner and is followed home by a stray poodle. In Faust's study, the poodle transforms into Mephistopheles. He reveals to Faust that although the misshapen pentagram carved into Faust's doorway has allowed him to enter, he cannot leave. Faust is surprised by Mephistopheles, is bound by mystical laws, and from this reason that he could make a pact, Mephistopheles says that he is willing to make a deal but wishes to leave for the night. Faust refuses to release him because he believes it would be impossible for him to catch Mephistopheles again. Mistopheles then tricks him into permitting a demonstration of his power. Faust falls asleep listening to the song of the spirits, allowing Mistopheles to escape by calling upon rats to chew away pentagram. So um, I think that Goethe was probably reading Kabbalistic or Freemasonic information going on his narrative here. It says in uh, Faust Part 2, rich in classical illusion, the romantic story of the first Faust is put aside and Faust wakes in a field of fairies to initiate a new cycle of adventures and purpose. This piece consists of five acts, relatively isolated episodes, each representing a different theme. Ultimately, Faust goes to heaven, for he loses only half of the bet. Angels who arrive as messages of divine mercy declare at the end of Act 5, he who strives on and lives to strive can earn redemption still. So in this paper from the Brill Society, from Christian Hebraicism to Jewish Studies, it's got a little bit about Goethe here. It says, young Goethe was fascinated by the Jews of his native Frankfurt. He frequently visited the walled Judengas Jewish quarter with its strange sights, smells and sounds. He was curious about their religion and way of life. And he frequently took walks there on the Sabbath. Goethe was hospitably received and well entertained by residents of the Judengas and was invited to a circumcision and a wedding. Had Goethe merely wished to learn more about the Jews, however, he could have done so without visiting the Judengas at all. He could have read his father's copy of Johann Jacob Schutz, Die Jüdische Wurdekieten, great, uh, sorry about my German, a massive four-volume work on Jewish history and life in Frankfurt. Goethe could also have read the Mishnah and other important Jewish books in Latin translation. Had he wished, he could even have studied Rabbinical Hebrew and Talmudic Aramaic, in addition to the Biblical Hebrew, which he had learned in school. With the help of textbooks written by Christian Hebraists, 
specifically to help Christian students read the Jewish classics in their original languages. In God's day, it was possible for non-Jews to study the Hebrew language, Jewish literature, and even Judaism without Jewish help. Okay, so this kind of proves my point that people were starting to learn what was actually written in the Talmud about Jesus. Christian Hebraism was a, an offshoot of Renaissance humanism. So let's put this in a modern context. Christian Zionism was an offshoot of the Renaissance humanism and its devotees. Biblical scholars, theologians, lawyers, physicians, astronomers, philosophers, and teachers in Latin schools borrowed and adapted ideas and literary forms from the post-biblical Hebrew literature to meet Christian cultural and religious needs. Generations of Christian Hebrew scholars had created an array of linguistic helps for Hebrew learning and had translated a number of Jewish classics, making them accessible to a broader reading public. They pioneered a new academic discipline, Jewish studies, albeit in a form which catered to the needs of Christians. By making Jewish learning more accessible to the educated public, these Christian Hebraists had a profound impact upon Western culture out of all proportion to their numbers. By the same token, these scholars created a knowledge of Jews, their religion, the way of life without regard for the effects that it might have upon Jews and Jewish communities. Christian Hebraists had in effect um, appropriated Jewish literature from its rightful custodians and exercised in what our parochia, the seer, called a dialectic of Christian power. Christian Hebraism drew its strength not only from the devotion of individual Hebraists to their discipline, but also from the active support of schools and universities as well as the government and churches which funded them. What began in the late 15th and early 16th century as the hobby of a few learned churchmen and gentlemen scholars such as Cardinal Gillies of Viterbo or Johannes Ruchelin, Jesuit, friend of the Jesuits, or the vocation of informal groups of pastors and professors such as these identified with the Rhineland School of Biblical Exegesis had become a recognised academic sub-discipline, a century later linked to theology but distinct from it. The rapid progress of Hebrew learning, which during this period included both the Hebrew Bible, the post-biblical Jewish literature, is all more astonishing since it took place. Goethe and the Jesuits, in this work on Goethe, the most comprehensive biography of the poet Father Alexander Baumgartner, S.J. discussed almost every reference made in Goethe's work to positive religion, Christianity and Catholicism. It is strange that Baumgartner never treated of the numerous references to the Jesuits. Although it is surely surprising to find that Goethe read and in most cases highly esteemed the works of more than 30 Jesuits. From his point of view as a non-Catholic and a son of the 18th century Goethe, could hardly be expected to understand the spiritual mission of the society. In 1828, he stated that Moliere's Tartuffel aroused the hatred of the class of people who, working on the quiet, threatened to become dangerous to the state. Um, in this article from the Judicious Museum in Berlin, the questions asked, was Goethe Jew too? And they get this question from a lot of visitors. When you do... A research of our library catalog for Goth, you could get this idea. 70 hits for works by or about the German poet. By contrast, Schiller only gets 16. And until a few years ago, Cotter's impressive edition of Goth's work from 1867 appeared in our permanent exhibition. Many people used to ask the visitor's desk, was Goth Jewish? No, he wasn't. But for many Jews, he was the paragon of German culture and his work symbolised membership in the German-educated middle class. A few months ago, the Richard M. Mayer Foundation gave us more than 100 books by and about Richard M. Mayer himself, the son of a banker, Rothschild, art, collection, art collector and man of letters was a Goth scholar. Mayer never acquired a proper professorship, but his 1895 biography of Goth won awards and was published again and again as a single volume in multiple volumes as a people's edition and a reserved edition. 
According to the biography, Goat saw nationalities merely as transitional forms. Statements like this illustrate the dilemma of German-Jewish assimilation during that period. If a Jewish reader of Goat placed the poet's cosmopolitanism in the foreground, he exposed himself to the accusation of misunderstanding the German essence of his writings. When he explicitly recognised just this quality in Goethe's language, his very right to have a say was contested. As Mayer emphasised, the German intellectual hero did in fact employ the idea of a world literature, as well as biblical references to He compared the Faustian pact with the devil with the basic motive of the wager from the book of Job. And yet, Goethe wasn't a ticket of admission. This is a quote from Hein. So in this article here uh, by Robert C. Hulab, University of California at Berkeley, we have this contrasting kind of personality of Goethe, and it says that anti-Semite Goethe would turn over in his grave if he knew that a Jew had received a prize that carries his name. The sentiments expressed here are not surprising. Goethe, the pride of German culture and a pure Aryan, was being associated with someone from an inferior race, the Jewish intellectual Sigmund Freud. Moreover, this Jew had scandalized the scientific world by presenting theories that had to do with matters any decent person would not mention in public, namely human sexuality. In calling into question the legitimacy of the legitimacy of Freud's work, the Volkische Bebachter more importantly seeks to deny a pseudo-scientific scholar and writer any place in the German community. We know, of course, that Goethe himself often dabbled in scientific arenas that were not always completely accepted by the science of his time or ours, and that an offensive sexuality is part of Goethe's works. And from the perspective of a moralistic 19th century part of his life as well, we also know that many of Goethe's early champions and not a small number of his early biographers were Jews. But Goethe's image, even if he could not always be advanced as a proto-Nazi or even a German nationalist, was for the general public one of a dignified and noble spirit above the common rabble. What did this thoroughly German patron of the highest ideals have to do with a quark Jewish intellectual, one generation removed from the ghetto. Was the awarding of the Goethe Prize to Sigmund Freud not a betrayal of its spirit, of its essence? So, you know, it's contrasting views of, of Goethe. Uh, from his early youth, he's been fascinated with the Jews. He's worked with Jews. And yet his romanticism, classism, is portrayed as Nazi and Aryan. Here in this Cambridge University article, it says, when it comes to religion, Goethe's reputation is anything but spotless. Heinrich Hein famously referred to Goethe as the Grobe Heed, the great heathen. August Wilhelm Schlegel took this one step further when he called Goethe a heathen who converted to Islam. Wolfgang Fruwald points out that in an altar painting by Conrad Erberhard for the St. Clara Hospital in Basel, Goethe is grouped with the heathens who cannot be converted by St. Paul. Similarly, Prince Metternich opposed the creation of a Goethe monument because of Goethe's spotty record on religion, declaring that he should not pay too much tribute to the memory of a man whose religious creed was not inoffensive. Finally, Roman Gardini, a letter to Ernst Butler, summed it up when he declared that Goethe had done more harm to Christianity than even Nietzsche. So what was Goethe's agenda here? So apparently Goethe was a Freemason. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe was initiated into Freemasonry on June 23, 1780, passed to the degree of fellow craft on March 3, 1781, and raised to the sublime degree of Master Mason on June 23, 1781, all at Amalia Lodge in Weimar, then the centre of German Enlightenment. So we don't know what nationality Goethe was, other than what we're told, that he's German, but he's certainly has a few suspect 
uh, red flags popping up here. So I'm trying to prove that this whole romantic and German classicism was infiltrated and deliberately controlled to bring about this pagan revival in the German culture. So here we have Caroline Schelling, and she is Ni Michaelis, widowed Boma, divorced Schlegel. So she's mixed with all of these philosophers. I mean, she's married to Boma and Schlegel. Her father was Michaelis. So let's have a quick look at him. Johann David Michaelis was a German biblical scholar and teacher. He was a member of a family that was committed to solid discipline in Hebrew and cognate languages, which distinguished the University of Halle, or Hale, I'm not sure how they, you say that, in the period of pietism. He was a member of the Göttingen School of History. Now, red flags are already popping up with this guy. They're saying he's German, but Michaelis is a Jewish name. Biography of Sir Archie Reuben Michaelis. He's a Jewish leader, businessman, politician. Michaelis, German, Dutch, and Jewish, Latinized, humanistic. So it comes from Michael. So, you know, anyone with a surname that's Michael or Michaels uh, is potentially has a Jewish heritage. So it's a surname of German origin. It is also found in the German-speaking part of Wallonia. But I'm betting that this guy is actually Jewish because when we look at his profile, Michaelis was born on the 27th of February, 1717 in Halle and uh, Saal. His pietistic Lutheran family. So what did we learn about pietism and the movement of pietism? It's linked to the Sabbatean Francus. His family were a pietistic Lutheran family, placed a great deal of importance in the study of Oriental languages in fulfilling the church goal. Now, what did Schlegel do? Schlegel's one of the main people who came up with the philosophy of Indo-European languages. He was trained for an academic life under his father's eye at Halle. He was influenced especially in philosophy by Sigmund J. Baumgarten. These people are all linked, or every one of them has a, you know, six degrees of separation. I, I'd say one or two degrees. So let's go back to his daughter. So she's married to all of these people, Schelling, Boma and Schlegel. Schelling was born at Göttingen in 1763, the daughter of Orientalist Johann David Michaelis, who taught at the Progressive University of Göttingen. She was educated by private tutors and by her father. In 1784, she married a district medical officer, Johann Boma, and the couple moved to Klausthal and in the Haas. After his death in 1788, she tried to live financially independently. Together with their only surviving daughter, she moved to Göttingen, then Marburg, and in 1792, she settled in Mainz. Now, I don't know if she's married to this particular Johann Frederick Bomer, but maybe a family member, historian, known for his register and a noted collection of characters and imperial documents of medieval Germany. After studying at the University of Göttingen and Heidelberg, Boma journeyed to Italy where he became interested in art history. You know, so what's the deal that she wasn't married to one of this person's family members, uncle or, you know, they're in the same fields, in the same city. I mean, here's another Johann Boma. And he's married to a Strauss. So this Strauss name comes up in this circle as well. Dr. Phil Johann George Wilhelm Bomer. So perhaps this one here is her husband because he's a doctor and he explains in her profile that she was married to a medical officer. So this guy had eight siblings, another Johann Frederick Herbert Bomer, Johann Franz Wilhelm Bomer. Out of nine children, they called three of them Johan. That's kind of weird. So if we look at, yeah, when we go to this page, George Wilhelm Bomer, without the E, German theologian and canon law scholar. It's the same picture. 
was a German theologian and canon law scholar, Jacobin of Mainz, and co-founder of the Mainz Republic, later justice of the peace and criminal lawyer in the Kingdom of Westphalia and private lecturer at the University of Göttingen. George Wilhelm Bomer belonged to the Bomer von Bomer, so it's basically the same family with the E and without, of lawyers who belong to the so-called pretty families in the electorate of Hanover and the early kingdom of Hanover. What are the pretty families? In the 18th and early 19th centuries in the electorate of Hanover the, and the kingdom of Hanover, the handsome families officially represented the third estate, the bourgeois, in addition to the nobility and clergy. They constituted its social top and often served as a state office. He was the son of George Ludwig Bomer and Henrietta Elizabeth Philip Mayer. Okay, this is a different spelling for Mayer. And grandson of Justice Henning Bomer and brother of Göttingen Law Professor Johann Frederick Erbhard Bomer. So we've got this guy here, Jacob Bohm, was a German philosopher, Christian mystic, and Lutheran Protestant theologian. So all of these Lutheran Protestant theologians who are Christian mystics. I mean, can we see here that the Reformation has been completely and utterly tampered with? It's not what we think it is. And I'm not here to discredit the Reformation or that there weren't honest people amongst the Reformers or people that gave their life. I don't want to destroy its credibility. For example, if we attack the Reformation, that we have no foundation for a Protestant or Protestant fight back against the corrupt Roman Catholic system. I'm certainly not causing an Hegelian argument here that one is better than the other because this is the system they use, right? One against the other. Destroy the Reformation and what do people have? Or maybe the Catholic Church can offer them this universal religion. You know, I'm not here to do that, but we have to recognize how we have been hoodwinked here. He was considered an original thinker by many of his contemporaries with Lutheran tradition, and his first book, commonly known as Aurora, caused a great scandal. In contemporary English, his name may be spelled Jacob Bohm. So, yes, Bohm with an E, retaining the older German spelling. In 17th century England, it was also spelled Beeman approximating the contemporary English pronunciation of German Bohm. Bohm had a profound influence on later philosophical movements such as German idealism, German romanticism. Hegel described Bohm as the first German philosopher. Well, I'm guaranteeing that this guy is not really German because all of these names are popping up again. I find it frustrating that these profiles say that they are German when we need to identify what their allegiances are to religious allegiances and we're finding as i found earlier that a, a lot of these people and groups were linked to people like sabbatai zevi and these particular religious groups so it's important to identify that because they are pretending they are being deceptive with their identity they're pretending to be something they're not. They're pretending to be Lutheran ministers, etc., when they're not. They're actually mystics, Kabbalists from this Chaldean priesthood that has flowed through these rabbinical families. Is it possible that this group have secretly infiltrated or secretly planted these families in the Protestant movement, when we look at how closely linked to this pious movement. Bohm's mentor was Abraham Behem. Wasn't that just a version of Bohm up here? Behemen, B-E-H-M-E-N, and his influencer was Behem. So slightly different spelling. Who, composed, uh, who corresponded with Valentin Weigel? Bohm joined the Conventicle of God's Real Servants, a parochial study group organised by Martin Moller. 
Bohm had a number of mystical experiences throughout his youth, culminating in visions in 1600. As one day he focused his attention into the exquisite beauty of a beam of sunlight reflected in a pewter dish. Does this sound like divination? He believed his vision revealed to him the spiritual structure of the world, as well as the relationship between God and man and good and evil. At the time, he chose not to speak of his experience openly, preferring instead to continue his work and raise a family. So the chief concern of Bohm's writing was the nature of sin, evil and redemption. Consistent with Lutheran theology, Bohm preached that humanity had fallen from a state of divine grace to a state of sin and suffering, that the force of evil included fallen angels who had rebelled against God. So false doctrine here. This is from the Mishnah. The information on these fallen angels rebelling against God is not in the Bible except to say that a third of the angels were taken with the dragon or Satan. That's the only information the Bible gives us on this. The rest of this information comes from the Mishnah, which is from the Babylonian exegesis from the rabbis. These are oral traditions that have been expanded upon by Babylonian rabbinical schools. And that God's goal was to restore the world to a state of grace. This is also sounds good, but you know, it ties in with the seven sephirot. Okay, so how do we know that Boma is talking about Kabbalism and not the real Bible? What well, says here, Boma's correspondence in Aurora of the seven qualities, planets, and humoral elements associations. Remember in the Kabbalah and the Sephirot, they're linked to the planets. So he's showing the astrology of how the planets are linked to these particular seven sephirot. And then there's a further three which make ten. In the tribus principis, or on the three principles of divine being, Bohm subsumed the seven principles into the trinity. So the dark world of the father sounds like the demiurge or the evil Abrahamic god that these people like to preach. The light world of the Holy Spirit and the world of Satan and Christ. This is dualism. It says in one interpretation of Bohm's cosmology, it was necessary for humanity to return to God and for all original unities to undergo differentiation, desire and conflict, as in the rebellion of Satan, the, serp the separation of Eve from Adam. So here we go. The separation of Eve from Adam is Kabbalism. That's the Adam Kadmon and the acquisition of the knowledge of good and evil. So this guy's a Kabbalist. But what's really interesting that I found out here is that these pious groups are all linked to this Sabbatean Frankus group. And when we go to the Chabad website, it said Sephiroth, the 710. Sephiroth, the seven divine attributes or emanations which are manifested in each of the four worlds and are the source of the corresponding ten faculties of the soul. So he's, he's speaking Kabbalism. And then we look at the picture of the Kabbalistic Sephirot and, and each Sephirot is depicted as a planet. So we've got ten here and seven planets. So it's an astrological Kabbalistic Babylonian religion brought to us by the Chaldean merchants. So this particular Boma, Jacobin under French occupation in Mainz. In 1788, Boma moved to the Lutheran Gymnasium in Worms. As a teacher and vice principal, the city awarded him, like his predecessor, the official title professor. There too, after a short time, he came into conflict with the predominantly Lutheran citizenry because of his enlightening statements. Boma himself was a reformed Protestant and in the spirit of his theological role model Carl Frederick Bard had tried to spread the idea of the enlightenment in the Lutheran grammar school by educating pupils to tolerance and independent thinking on the basis of reason. So we see how the counter-reformation has corrupted the reformation, the words of the apostles and the corruption, the mixing. Basically, this is what they're doing is they're mixing the truth with a lie. This is what happened in the beginning with the sons of God, who were the sons of Seth, marrying the daughters of men, the daughters of Cain. Cain was a disobedient 
self-fulfilling person. He didn't want to do the will of God. He wanted to do his own will, offer his own sacrifice. And this is what happened in Genesis in the beginning, in the time of Noah, when men saw that the daughters or the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they mixed with these daughters of men, daughters of Cain. And what they mixed was their hatred. These Cain's children hated God. Cain was disobedient to God. He murdered his own brother so he could have his own way, do his own will. He didn't want to sacrifice what God asked him to. He wanted to sacrifice his own will and do his own religion and do his own thing. And so once these sons of God, who were sons of Seth, married these women, just like Solomon, who had a thousand wives and concubines, he started to mix his religion with these people. This is why mixing and multiculturalism is not a good thing because we're mixing cultures, we're mixing religions, and we're mixing genetics as well. And the Bible tells us that we inherit the sins of the Father. Deuteronomy 5 says, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So thou shalt not mix, okay? And thou shalt not make thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the waters beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children until the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. So when these sons of God married these daughters of Cain, this is what happened. They received this jealousy, the iniquity of the fathers for four generations. Now, 440s, which is a generation, what's that? 160 years. And if these fathers just keep continuing on this injustice of bowing down and worshipping false idols or mixing these false religions with the religion of the kingdom, that just keeps going on and on and on for a long time. Now, the only thing that breaks this curse is Jesus. So if you are born again of the Spirit, then you are not subject to this curse. Complaint against Boma with Emperor Joseph II in Vienna, in which they accused him of free-spirited attitudes, undigested enlightenment crickets, and derisive contempt for all faith. So he's part of this revolution and this enlightenment, which led to the German classicism movement and romantic period, all these periods that pop up in arts and that they're, they're all designed to corrupt society with liberalism and what we now know as cultural Marxism. He's part of the Jacobins, which were part of these same groups, Freemasons. They're all working together against corrupting the truth. So here we have another page on Caroline Schelling, and it says her name, Dorothea Caroline Albertine Michaelis, daughter of Professor Johann David Michaelis, and she married Johann Franz Willem Bomer, son of the professor, and Geheimer Justice Rat George Ludwig Bomer. Is that the same man? He was into the law, legal scholar in Gottingen. Caroline's father-in-law from 1752 married to Henrietta Philippine Elizabeth Nee Mayer. So this is not the same Bomer, but, you know, he's marrying a Mayer in this particular Bomer's family line. His daughter marries a Mayer. They're interlinking families. Johann Lorenz Mayer. So, yeah, here's this other guy here. Caroline's brother-in-law, for whose wife she was mistaken after the incident in Mainz, Juris, politician, librarian. So it's his brother, this guy here, the Jacobin and the uh, the fake Lutheran minister, George Wilhelm Bomer, is the brother-in-law of Caroline Schelling. Caroline Schelling, Nee Michaelis, divorced Schlegel, so she married Schlegel as well. So these people are all linked to this movement, this German romanticism, this German paganism. So in this article on Caroline Schelling, there's a whole bunch of names that she's linked to. Carl Frederick Barth, theologian with a 
checked and controversial career. So all of these theologians of conflict with the established church because of his Enlightenment views. He composed a comedy satirizing the anti-Enlightenment religion edict in Prussia. Of course he did. Eugene Rose de Beauharnais, French prince, viceroy of the Kingdom of Italy under Napoleon. His stepfather, Prince of Venice, hereditary Grand Duke of Frankfurt, Duke of Luchtenberg and Prince Esch Stat, first child and only son of Napoleon's first wife, Josephine. Bernays, I wonder if he's related to Edward Bernays. Independent scholar in Bonn from 1873, professor of German literature in Munich from 1890, again a private scholar in Karlsruhe, studied in Bonn in Heidelberg, converted from Judaism to Christianity. No, he didn't. Never did. In 1856, edited Various of Goethe's writings also taught the art of historian Heinrich Wolflin, who succeeded Jacob Burkhardt in Basel. He reviewed George Waite's initial publication of Caroline's Letters, examined Wilhelm Schlegel's translation of Shakespeare, including Caroline's role in it, and published a revised edition of that translation. Bohm, Jacob, this Theosophical author, mystic from Celestia, claimed his writings reflected solely what he learned from divine illumination. First works and later works prompted several rounds of opposition from Luther and pastor Gregorius Richter, who brought an end to Bohm's writings for a time. This is the guy that influenced Hegel. So we've got Bohm, Bohmer, Bohmer, all the Bohmer family are involved here. Bonaparte, Louis, young brother of Napoleon Bonaparte, husband of Hortense Berhanes, daughter of Empress Josephine, Napoleon made him king of Holland. So here we have Schlegel, but he was Caroline's second husband, writer, critic, translator, philologist, elder brother of Frederick Schlegel from 1786, studied theology and philology in Göttingen, where he became closely acquainted with Gottfried August Berger, who acted as his literary mentor and the two also translating Shakespeare's Midsummer Night Dream after Schiller's severe criticism of Berger in 1791. Schlegel never had a genuinely easy relationship with Schiller. It was during this period that he first got to know Caroline, who had returned to her family in Gottingen. After being widowed from 1791, he worked as a private house tutor in Amsterdam and was already active in, as literary and critic and reviewer, then being invited by Schiller to contribute to the latest periodical Die Horen. In 1818, he was in line for an appointment as professor in Berlin, but chose Bonn instead, so that his new wife, Sophie Paulus, daughter of H.E.G. Paulus, could be nearer her mother. But in a bit of dispute between Wilhelm and the family, Sophie never joined him in Bonn or anywhere else as his wife. Though they never divorced, in Bonn he spent the rest of his life as respected scholar of Sanskrit and Indian studies. This is important. In which capacity he also viewed as one of the founders of modern comparative linguistics. This is where the theory of the Germans being Indo-European comes from. The wife, Dorothea Brendel, Mendelssohn, Schlegel. So she's related to the Mendelssohn, this Rothschild link. They're all the, linked to these Jewish families and they're linked to Sabatian Frankist. So Frederick Schlegel was her husband. Schlegel, Karl Wilhelm Frederick, writer, critic, philosopher, younger brother of August Wilhelm Schlegel initially sent to Leipzig as an apprentice to prepare for a career in banking. Well, what families do that? We know who they are. But soon quit and was permitted to pursue university studies after studying on his own to pass his abitur in 1789. Studied in Göttingen and Leipzig where he became acquainted with Frederick von Hardenberg Novalis in 1790-94, he saw then philosophy, history, and classical philology. In 1793, while in Leipzig, he acted 
as a courier for letters between Caroline in Luca and Wilhelm in Amsterdam and was godfather of her child born there. Joined Wilhelm and Caroline in Jena in 1796. He the more philosophically inclined of the two brothers and as such the one ultimately providing much of the philosophical articulation for the nascent romantic school. Even before moving to Jena, he had already published articles in J.F. Reichard's journal on contemporary German literature and had been engaged in an intensive study of classical antiquity on which he published several important pieces including De Gretchen und Roma, 1797, anticipating with the contrast between objective and interesting Schiller's contrast between naive and sentimental with regard to ancient and modern writers. Apparently after alienating Schiller, the reason is not really documented, Frederick was advised to leave Jena moving thence to Berlin where he frequented the leading literary and cultural salons and met Dorothea Veet, his later wife, Dorothea Mendelssohn. His essay on Goethe's novel Wilhelm Meister is viewed as one of the program statements of the group and his own novel Lucinde in 1799 created a sensation with his characters obviously based on frederick and dorothea and erotic subject matter and candor he returned to jenna with dorothea in 1799 though they were not yet married for the brief fluorescence of the romantic school though trouble within the group was quick to surface he acquired his doctorate in jenna with a rather chaotic public defense documented in this edition and then tried to establish himself as a lecturer in transcendental philosophy, was essentially overwhelmed by the power of Schelling's popularity when the later returned from Bamberg and resumed his own lecturing. Frederick's play, Ella Cos, was a failure. After the group dissolved, he and Dorothea moved to Paris, where he studied Sanskrit and published the journal Europa. Now, India and Tibet at this time was full of Jesuits. And this whole... Sanskrit oriental religion thing was huge. Moving then to Cologne in 1804 and converting with Dorothea to Catholicism, he said he's an atheist. His own thought having taken a clearly more conservative Christian turn in the meantime from 1808 in Vienna where he worked as secretary at the Viennese court socializing in conservative circles there also participating in the Congress of Vienna and the Frankfurt meeting of the German Confederation. His later lectures on history, literature and philosophy along with his journal Concordia were characterised by cultural conservatism and an inclination to mysticism. Oriental religions, Kabbalah. So in this article, Journal of Education and Learning, published by the Canadian Centre of Science and Education, Effects of German Romanticism on National Socialist Education Policies, Steely Romanticism. And it's about national socialist education policies put into practice between 1933 and 1945 in Germany has been under the influence of Romanticism, which is one of the important currents in the history of German thought that began in the middle 19th century. It began a lot earlier than that. It was plotted out a lot earlier than that. Such being under the influence does not refer to a passive situation, but it rather means intentional exposure by Nazi ideologues. The meeting of Romanticism with National Socialism led to the most dramatic scenes of the history. Educational institutions where the victims of war were trained by partially fulfilled and the task assigned to them regarding to ideological instrumentalism, to destroy and to be destroyed, putting an end to both their lives own and the lives of others due to this romantic exposure. Primary, secondary and higher education students have been the object of the great catastrophe in the first half of the 20th century. It will be possible to see the effects of German romanticism, though getting to the bottom of the intellectual foundations of the period's tragic actions such as burning books, redesigning the curriculum on the line of national socialism, and preventing the dissemination of dissenting opinions by monopolizing the press. So, you know, this is just the abstract of this paper here. This is pretty much what happened in history. I believe I've shown the agenda people behind this movement and that it was a well-plotted out long-term plan 
to, I believe, gain back the territory of Israel through the Balfour Declaration in the First World War and in the Second World War forcing the Jews of Europe back to Palestine. But also the secondary motive was to deceive the European people of who they are, their heritage, and to give them this false narrative as these pagan Orientalists, all based on linguistics. I mean, it's pretty obvious to me after doing all of this research of this period and the Enlightenment and the Reformation that we've been handed our history and our culture and our art movements basically on a platter. Nothing's really changed. In the 20th century, we saw this happening with media and advertising and the manipulation of our attitudes and worldview. Basically, I don't think any of us really comprehend or understand what is real and what we really like because we've never really had the option. I mean, we look at this information that was given to us via these media, books, art history, all of it's been tainted by these groups and these people with this huge agenda against truth. I just wonder what kind of person I could have been if I'd lived in a world where I'd been given truth and not all this bullshit that these people have fed humanity. And I'm happy to be awake to what's happening, but it's a matter of potential. The potential of the human race could be so good and yet look what we've become. It's really sad. If we look at Schlegel and this Indo-European theory, because that's what it is, it's a theory based on linguistics, we have this Aryan philosophy coming out of this with uh, Blavatsky theosophy, which led us to Nazism. And we have this Hegelian two world wars. And what came out of these two world wars was, number one, the Balfour Declaration, and number two, the initiation of this Israel we have today that is just this, well, let's face it, it's a burden for the whole world. It's a mess. and. I just think of the millions and millions of Europeans that died, not to mention all the people that died in the Holodomor, because these people have such control over the written word, over media, and today we have film and television and social media. It's just, it's beyond repair. Uh, how, do we, how do we fix this problem? It's the greatest deception ever. If people are looking for the mark of the beast, I mean, can't we see this, that this mark is well and truly in the minds of men because everything we know has been corrupted and is just one big lie. So I'll continue on in the next video. See you in the next episode.